Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles podcast that we call Things We Said Today. This is a program where we talk about anything and everything that has to do about the Beatles, the group, the solo careers, their music, their history, whatever comes to mind, sometimes whatever's in the news. Very often it is. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the three regular co-hosts of the show. You might know me from my other uh, two Beatles programs, Every Little Thing, a syndicated Beatles radio program, and another Beatles podcast solo show called Talk More Talk. And I'm being joined by my two regulars. We have one of the DJs over at WFUV in New York City. He's been there for, I keep forgetting, I think it's 35 years. It's somewhere over 30. And I'm the irregular host, Kevin, <laughs> of, of uh, Things We Said Today. It is me, Darren DeVivo, WFUV. Happy holidays, everyone. Now that you planted that thought in everyone's heads there, Darren, um, <laughs> but let's just say for the sake of making it sound better, 35 years. Okay. And also we have a contributing writer for Beatle Fan Magazine and for many years a writer in the classical department at the New York Times, the author of uh, several Beatle books, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and... Got that something, how the Beatles, I want to hold your hand, changed everything, and that's our own Alan Cozen. Hello, Alan. Hello, Ken. Hello, everybody. <sighs> On today's show, what was that for, Alan? That wasn't no, me. No, that was me. That was the crowd applause. Oh, okay. <laughs> we need to put some sound effects into this show. <laughs> On, uh, on today's show, we have a special guest with us, and he's written more Beatle books than probably anybody on the planet, and he's got a new one out, which happens to be called The Beatles White Album and The Launch of Apple. And we welcome to the show once again, Bruce Spizer. Hi, Bruce. Hi, glad to be here with you guys. Always fun to talk Beatles with people that really know their Beatles. Yeah, we had a great time at the White Album Symposium. Yes, and, indeed. And uh, we're going to be talking White Album and the new book uh, in just a few minutes, but I just want to get to a few news items before we do, and you guys can chime in on any of these if you like. I'm sure that you all know that um, yesterday Paul performed his last concert of 2018 with a show at the O2 Arena in London, and joining him on stage was Ringo who drummed on Get Back, and Ron Wood was also in the band. Others attending the show were Roger Daltrey, uh, Chris Martin, Emma Thompson was also there. And uh, before we continue, I just want to thank one of our listeners who wrote to us, who was there at the show, ah. Chris, Chris Demetrio, who said he saw the show and loved it. He said Paul's voice was shaky at first, but got better as the show went along, especially on numbers like Here Today and Blackbird. Uh, Chris says he had a fragility, which really added to the drama, pathos, and sadness of the songs. And obviously, it was a thrill to see Ringo there. It's now one of his top five all-time concerts. So did you guys see the uh, video, which is mm -hmm. all over online, of Paul and Ringo and Ron Wood? And uh, any comments on it? How about you, uh, Alan? Uh, that would just look like a fun clip and um, nothing really to say about it. <laughs> it was just nice to see the two of them together. It looked and like it was exciting to be there, you know, um, and a lot of the various clips that are on there, you can sort of see everybody in front of the person filming it also filming it on their iPhones. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so there's a, an awful lot of examples of it out there of different lengths. And, yeah. Uh, I, I, I hate to constantly get tarp on this, but it pains me to hear Paul singing. Uh, sounding the way he sounded in that clip. But as for the historic, uh, the, the significance of the historical significance of it, it was great to see Ringo behind the drum kit. Looked like Ringo was playing with a little, a little more fire than he might one of his shows, you know. So that was cool. And, uh, and I love Ron Wood, so just seeing him up there was a great, great little extra. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, like you said, for history's sake, you got two Beatles and a Rolling Stone there. Mm -hmm. And actually, yeah. with, with Roger Daltrey in the audience, hey, come on. <laughs> <laughs> you could have had a member of the Who up there, too. So, Bruce, did you see the clip? I haven't had a chance. I've been, as a tax attorney, been really busy trying to get year-end stuff done on my law profession. I do remember seeing uh, Ringo and 
Paul at Radio City Music Hall and just the electricity in the audience whenever you get two Beatles together. When you get one together, it's exciting, but, <laughs> you know, it's fun. And, of course, I had fun afterwards because in walking out, I figured I'd play the dumb person, and I kept asking people, that was kind of fun, but who was that guy on bass who came in and hogged the show at the end? <laughs> and people were looking at me like I was crazy, like, you don't know? So sometimes it's fun to play the fool again. <laughs> Also, uh, at that show and his previous show in Liverpool at the Echo Arena, Paul performed Wonderful Christmas Time, the first time he's done that in two years. However, you may have heard that at the time of uh, his homecoming gig in Liverpool, um, his London home was burglarized. Yeah. And uh, police say there were signs of forced entry, and a spokesman for Paul wouldn't say whether Paul or his wife Nancy were in town when the intruder struck. And uh, from what I've been told, the Metropolitan Police say that no arrests have been made yet, and inquiries for the burglary continue. And nobody said she came in through the bathroom window. No. Actually, I did see that that uh, uh, song title used in a couple of the uh, newspaper articles that I read online. So uh, that actually disturbed me a little, because it happened on the anniversary of John's death. Yeah, and uh, can't help but think that George, uh, with all the security he had at his uh, home, where they, when he was broken into, and now it's happened to Paul. Uh, this is Cavendish Avenue, I assume. Yeah, and it is kind of like I know he. Uh, I would think Paul's got a lot of security and cameras and whatnot, but that's sort of in a neighborhood that you and I or anyone else could walk you know, and stand in front of the house. And uh, yeah. so uh, it was a little disturbing to me, that story. But yeah, uh, yeah it's, that, an, it's a nice neighborhood. Sure. Yeah. Ooh. So it is. Um, yeah. In fact, when I was there many years ago, I had to continually keep checking the address because it seemed a little too right here for everybody to walk in front of. And I always thought it would be more secluded and hard to see or hard to get near. And but um uh, it was a disturbing story uh, when I heard that that happened. And there hasn't been really any follow-up other than they haven't caught anyone yet. Um, did yeah. that place used to get broken into all the time? I mean, even during the Beatles era, there were girls that managed to get in there and leave things. And I, I, I thought even um, she came in through the bathroom window was based on one of those incidents. Yeah, right. It was. Yeah. yeah, well, that was the 60s. That was okay then, you know, for the, <laughs> yeah. that to happen. You know, girls breaking in. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it sounds funny when you say it, but it is a lot more dangerous now than it was then. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, um, other news. Uh, Miley Cyrus and Sean Lennon performed together on Saturday Night Live where they did the John and Yoko classic of, ha of Happy Christmas War is Over. The two of them have already recorded the song in the studio with a new version, and they plan to make a video together. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it's done yet. Mark Ronson, by the way, was also part of the band with Miley and Sean. And if you watched, you also would have spotted, uh, is it Isley or Isley Juber, who is the daughter of Lawrence and Hope Juber? Mm -hmm. Ilzy. Ilzy. I'm sorry. Okay. Ilzy was in there, too. So um, I did see this performance. Wasn't too crazy about it. I mean, my, my main complaint about it was that you could barely hear Sean. I don't even know if his mic was up at all. Uh, he was more or less, you know, kind of uh, in the background there. Yeah. I wish he would have had more presence. I wish they would have let him sing lead on one verse uh, or something like that. I don't know. I'm not too crazy about Miley Cyrus's voice. I know it's powerful. Wasn't too thrilled with it. But, I thought um, John did a pretty good job on the original. <laughs> I don't think we'll argue with that. Okay. But, uh, you know, it's I, nice that it's being covered. There's a lot of cover versions, as you know, of, of Happy Christmas and Wonderful Christmas Time. And just to have John's son, uh, son up there doing it, uh, I thought that that was a nice touch. But I just would have hoped that he would have, you would have heard him more. It yeah. did look like uh, Sean's been spending a little time at the uh, at Gold's Gym lately. Uh, <laughs> Because uh, he looked like uh, he's been uh, pumping iron lately. And I'm not exactly sure what Mark Ronson was doing and what his role was there. But it's always nice, I guess, that uh, I hate to sound old when I say this, 
but I am the youngest person on the show right now. Uh, <laughs> I hate to. It, it's always nice when the younger generation gets a bit of ex, you know get exposed to uh, an old classic Beatles song, and uh, you know that the old is getting embraced by the new. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. I don't think anyone would argue with that. Let me offer a slightly dissenting view. This <laughs> seems to be part of my job here. I, I, I agree with a lot of what Ken said. I'm not a big Miley Cyrus fan, um, and I'm also not crazy about her vocal timbre and all that stuff. But I thought the and, – and I also agree that Sean should have been louder. And even the idea of him singing a verse, yeah, that, that might have been a nice idea. But I thought it was a killer performance. I really did. I, I – you know, the the song itself isn't much. We've talked about it before. The melody is really right off of Stew Ball, you know, which is a, a an old folk song. The lyric message was a message they were trying to get across at the time and is still obviously important. You know, the part Sean was singing that none of us could hear, war is over if you want it. But I thought, you know, she really kind of belted that song out. I mean, I, I was sitting on the edge of the couch saying, whoa, you know, I have to, I have to actually get a copy of this track. Don't own any other Miley Cyrus, but I, I think I want that one. Mm. Okay. Well, we can agree to disagree. Sure. Uh, I wasn't I wasn't crazy about it's it. That's what we at, do. <laughs> at some point here on this show, because she just brought it up, Alan, we're going to have a debate over this Happy Christmas and Stew Ball uh, <laughs> issue. Because I'm telling you, I, I'm I grew up on Peter Paul and Mary's music, their album In the Wind, which had Stew Ball on it. Mm -hmm. I played probably about as much as most Beatle albums. Mm -hmm. And when Happy Christmas came out, I never connected those two songs. Much the same way. I mean, they're similar. They are similar, mm -hmm. but they are different in a lot of ways. The same way that My Sweet Lord and He's So Fine are different. You know, there's similarities, but there is a difference between the two of them. But we could save that for another show. Sure. Okay. Um, also, co a copy of the contract that officially dissolved the Beatles is... Uh, in an online auction at Sotheby's, and it's actually ending today. <laughs> I just found out about it today. And we're doing this on uh, December the 17th. All four Beatles signed the contract in 1974, which broke the last legal ties holding the band together. It's expected to fetch up to $50,000, but we'll probably know more by the time this show gets posted. Also, a special concert that was a tribute to the Beatles' White Album was held at the Granny Museum in Los Angeles. And among those that performed happened to be Lawrence Juber and Denny Sywell of Wings, mm -hmm. Albert Lee, Billy J. Kramer, Joey Mollen, Jeremy Clyde, Phil Salm of the Rembrandts, Elliot Easton of the Cars, Dishwalla. You had to expect Ron Dante to be there. And um, Dennis Stefano of the Buckinghams. So uh, interesting that there was that uh, tribute show there. Has anyone heard anything about it? I only know who performed. So I, I just thought it was kind of a drag. Uh -huh. <coughs> uh <-huh>. mm. <laughs> no, no Archie's jokes in there, though, huh? No. Okay. Also, MusicUniverse.com reports that a 50th anniversary edition of the Rolling Stones concert show Rock and Roll Circus will be reissued in expanded form next spring. We all know John and Yoko were in it, as, of course, were the Stones, The Who, Jethro Tull, Eric Clapton, Marianne Faithful, and Taj Mahal. A few last items here. Paul has got together with actress Emma Stone, and they appear in Paul's new video for his anti-bullying song, Who Cares?, which premieres this week on Apple Music. So look out for that. And I'm sure it's going to be on YouTube fairly soon right after that. <laughs> and uh, one last item here. The great L.A. session bass player, Joe Osborne, passed away this week. And he appeared on countless hit records throughout the 60s and 70s in particular. Uh, but the reason I bring him up is because, of well, the only connection that I know of him with the Beatles because uh, when George Harrison was working on Jackie Lomax's album, Is This What You Want? And we can get into that, Bruce, on the show. He had to fly to L.A. and he met with members of the Wrecking Crew there. And Joe Osborne played on Jackie Lomax's album, which 
George produced, as did Hal Blaine and Larry Nechtel and members of the Wrecking Crew. All right, and that was uh, you know tremendous loss. He's he's been on so many hit records that we all know and love, and uh, he put his stamp on a lot of them. You know, so I don't know if any of you are familiar with Joe Osborne's work, but uh, you know we mourn the passing of him. Great talent. Suffice to say, you've heard his work if you're not aware of it. Yeah, well, if you want to know, because there's so many of them, Aquarius and Let the Sun Shine In from the Fifth Dimension has some great bass playing on it, and that was Joe. And um, so many artists like the Fifth Dimension, the Association, Gary Lewis, uh, the Carpenters. I actually, you know, know his name because I grew up on the Carpenters' music in the '70s, and he's in the credits there on so many of their albums. I think all of them. So uh, here's to you, Joe. All right. So we have Bruce Spicer here as our special guest. He has his brand new book out, which we're t- in which we're talking about the White Album and the launch of Apple Records. So I'm just going to start this conversation with the simplest of questions, Bruce, because um, you say it in your book and you told me not too long ago that the White Album is actually your favorite Beatles album. Yeah. And in a world where, you know, we can change our opinions about the Beatles and our favorite album can change from year to year. I think pretty much consistently it stayed with you as your favorite Beatles album. Absolutely. What I loved about it was the variety in the music. It's amazing to me that one group could pretty much just about cover every type of pop music and do it well. And to me, that's what made it so fascinating. My introduction to the album was different than your younger listeners who you know, may have heard a few songs off the hits collection and then kind of just one day got the album and heard it start to finish. But for me, it started a week before the album came out when AM stations across the nation, including WTIX in my hometown of New Orleans, were playing tracks from the album, which was extraordinary in those days where, first of all, record companies generally didn't give an album out and say, you can start playing it a week in advance. And secondly, Album cuts didn't get much airplay on AM, although Sgt. Pepper did change that a little bit. But here it was that Friday night, about every five or six songs, and here we are with another track from the Beatles' new album. And, you know, you'd hear something like Back in the USSR, and then you'd hear Oh, Blah, Dee, Oh, Blah, Da, which was Calypso. And then, you know, you heard this lullaby, Good Night. And it was just so many different types of music And that's, to me, what fascinated me before it even came out. And um, I heard Revolution 9 that Saturday night. And, you know, how how weird that was, I can assure you. (laughs) You know, it was one of those things where I jokingly say, hard to believe, but I didn't have a date that Saturday night. I didn't, and I listened to WTIX and kept hearing songs from the album. And the other interesting thing was that Saturday during the day, Um, I saw Yellow Submarine because Yellow Submarine didn't get to the States until uh, late November. So, you know, it was kind of quite a weekend. And, of course, that Monday I called up the radio uh, at the radio station, the record store, and wanted to know when that have it in. And, uh, of course, I bugged the hell out of that guy. must have called him every day. And I remember him telling me on Wednesday that he said, I'm only going to get in five copies and I'm going to get in another 20 on Monday. But, you know, the, the album is in such demand that the distributor told me that I won't have my full allotment. When I was researching the book, that pretty much is how it was throughout the United States. So that was kind of fun to see my experience wasn't unique. Um, the other fun thing about WTIX was they would play the top 10 at 10 every weeknight, you know, 10 most requested songs. And by Wednesday night, the entire top 10 were songs from the White Album. You know, and that's an album that hadn't even been released yet. So that gives you an idea of the power that those songs had. It reminds me of how when the Beatles invaded America, uh, when Meet the Beatles exploded the way that it did, and there were some radio stations, AM stations, that were playing album cuts. Yeah, I remember hearing I Want to Be Your Man. So, you know, you were hearing uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand. You were hearing She Loves You. You were hearing Please Me. And you were hearing, uh, I want to be your man, because Ringo was the most popular Beatle in the States. Mm. But even on the charts of some of these radio stations, these album cuts were on there, too. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it reminds me of how the Beatles dominated 
in, in that regard with what you're saying there. But for someone like yourself, and I, I'm going to just play devil's advocate here, because from the very beginning, the Beatles always were diverse. Yeah. You may not have realized that at the time. We may have just thought, hey, they're a pop rock band. But gradually, as they progressed from album to album, and you saw, I mean, just listen to Revolver or Sgt. Pepper, they explored so many different musical styles there. Would you say the White Album was just a natural transition from that? Or was it, a, you know, for you, from what you remember, was it a stark contrast? Well, it wasn't from a film? contrast. I mean, Sgt. Pepper had vaudeville and various other things on it. And I think uh, William Mann of the Times of London talked about the the variety of the music. But, you know, the White Album was like the, you know, Sgt. Pepper on steroids as far as variety of <laughs> musical styles. Mm-hmm. Bruce, uh, can you share with us your memories of when you did finally buy your copy of yeah. the album? And yeah, I, I, I told my mom, you need to be home Friday at 3.20, because that's about when I would get home, you know, 3.20, 3.25. So she drove me to the record store. And, of course, in the car on the way home, I took the shrink wrap off the album and opened it up and saw the black and white portraits. I knew there were other things in it, but I didn't want to mess them up till I got home. And I asked my mom if I could play it on the family stereo, because in my room, I had one of those mono record players that looked like a hat box with, um, you know, red and black plaid, and you flip the lid up, and there was a turntable and a speaker, and it played at, you know, four different speeds and all that other mm. stuff, and had a needle that would ruin anything. And my mom said, sure. So I sat in our living room put the record on and flipped the poster over and followed along with the lyrics and played it straight through, which was a little over an hour and a half. Then I took a break for dinner and then I did the same thing two more times. And then that night I put the four portraits up on the wall in my bedroom. <laughs> you know, I should say for you poor folks who are either too young or lived out of town and didn't own a tape recorder... <laughs> <laughs> Those of us who did and listened to FM radio um, had the White Album, or not all of it, maybe ten. I, th I thought it was 10 songs. Bruce in his book says uh, a dozen about a week or, or so earlier than radio stations were allowed to play it. And, you know, yeah. you, you kind of knew by then that uh, ABC FM had it. And you knew by then that, you know, they had it early. They were saying that. And you knew that they were only going to have it until the lawyers from Capitol could sort of get to their door and, and, and hit him with a restraining order or something. And so, you know, you had the tape. So I had so a what tape. What they were of, doing was kind of the, the Peter ooh. Sellers tape. Yeah, that, that was, turned out to be. I mean, we didn't. Yeah, we didn't know it then, of course. We didn't know it then. I didn't then. get that in, in New Orleans, but it was, you know, some songs from the album yeah, and also, uh, according to my research, Not Guilty was included on the Peter Sellers tape. So I guess some people had that tape when they went and bought the album, wondered where Not Guilty went to. Yeah, that um, that wasn't broadcast, Not Guilty. I kept the tape until the White Album came out and everything on my tape was on the album and, and they okay. they would play it you know not just a, a track here and a track there they said okay you know we're gonna we're gonna play the new beatles thing now and they didn't even know the titles you know like yeah. um mm. everybody got something to hide except me and my monkey was called something else uh you know come on come on or something i mean they were just they were just making up what they could because they just had a, a probably a a tape or an acetate and uh, no titles. Fortunately, somebody else who taped it kept it, and there is now a bootleg of one of those broadcasts uh, floating around. And I, I got it and played it, and remember hearing that day. <laughs> remember the, the DJ's comments and and the whole thing. They they also the first time they played it, it was really rough sounding. Yeah. And before they played it again, they EQ'd it, and it sounded an awful lot better uh, the, the second time. But they only were able to play it, I'd say, less than half a dozen times before the lawyers got there. Yeah, and the thing was um, that about five days after that, the radio stations were allowed to actually play the real thing. And it's possible that the seller's tape may have had some impetus for capital to give them the go-ahead because traditionally record companies 
didn't want the records played that much in advance for fear that it could inhibit sales. But in the case of the Beatles, of course, it made people even all the more anxious to to sure. buy the album itself. And and I remember not being at all deterred about the price. It was double of what a normal album would be. But this wasn't a case of like, you know, well, it's a 30 minute album and this double album is going to be about 50 minutes because they couldn't fit it on. I mean, this was an hour and a half of music, which made it the equivalent of like three capital albums of the Beatles from the early 60s. So mm -hmm. you really felt you were getting your money's worth. I seem to remember it being about eight ninety nine at the time. On sale, out. yeah. Yeah. On sale. I had to, I, I told this story a few times at the um at the Monmouth thing, but um I don't know if I've if we've talked about this on the show, but I had to bring mine back like eight times because it kept skipping on birthday. <laughs> yeah. Mm. And uh You know yeah, why? I, I think you needed a different record player, but uh, definitely, you know what? Oh, definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um You know what, Alan? Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't get the White Album until, I think, 1976. My God. And I was, I was 11, and it was, it was an Apple pressing, so it was probably right at the end of the line there. Mm -hmm. And my, my copy, Birthday Skipped, on oh, my right. phonograph. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And it drove me batty. And then one day, I played it on my father's more expensive turntable. It didn't skip, and it never skipped again anywhere mm -hmm. that I would play it after that. Yeah. But it's, huh. I just had a flashback of my copy skipping, and I had a fit. Yeah, you know, this is what EMI was worried about, why the Beatles were always complaining they wanted more bass, and yeah. EMI saying, well, we don't want people's record players to skip. That was, ex I was their nightmare, bringing it back eight times. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and after maybe the second or third time, I decided that um, since I was going to have to, you know, this getting to the store where I got it was like a two bus deal and you know it was big pain in the butt so I decided to punitively keep the poster and the portraits each time I brought it back <laughs> till I got one that worked <laughs> now you know you realize you may have given up a lower number uh, to keep doing this insane project of yours <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true, but I wanted one that played. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> and I, I still have my copy, and I have a very low Jacksonville number. Mm. So while my number isn't low, you know, because the lowest numbers were on the West Coast, and then Jacksonville, and then the highest numbers actually were in Scranton. So your number was probably pretty high anyway, Alan. Yeah, that's probably true. So we should talk about the book. Um, you know, you've yeah, done let's a, do that. You've okay. done a book about Apple. You've done a book about, you know, all of the Beatles, various press. You've done two books about Apple, really. And, you know, the various Beatles albums as they've come out and the permutations. And, and yet you found a way to get that information into this volume with a whole lot of other information. Yeah, um, you know, kind of what happened was, First of all, I wasn't going to do any more books. I, I figured the last book I did was number nine, and it was a good way to go out. And um, I ended up doing a Pepper book simply because I had written this essay that I thought would be you know, a really cool essay. And then I realized if it went in Beatle fan, as much as I love Beatle fan, they weren't going to have all these color images to go with it that I wanted. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, maybe I'll put out my own magazine. And then I thought, nah, let's just put out a book. <laughs> and went with the you know different perspectives, got different people to write some pieces, and also did these fan recollections for the Pepper book, which was kind of cool because you know I wanted to see if other people experienced Pepper the way I did, and hear people's stories. And when the Pepper book came out, I thought, okay, that's fine. And of course, naturally, people are like, well, of course, you're doing a White Album book, sort of the same way I'm sure Apple had people saying, well you release this deluxe pepper. So of course you're doing a deluxe white album. So it was the same type of thing. And I thought, okay, well, yeah, why not? So, um, you know, I did the fan recollection thing and it was kind of fun because when people sent in their fan recollections, if they were somebody who was a contemporary of mine, I would ask them, you know, well, if you have your original album, send in your number. So, uh, in the book, you'll notice a lot of the people mm -hmm. did after their name, I put their, album number in parentheses so that was kind of fun and hearing the stories and denny sidewell 
pointed out that he actually got into the Beatles because of the White Album. He was a jazz session drummer uh, playing in the Catskills and other places. And when he heard the White Album, that really turned him on to the Beatles. And he went back and checked out the other music. Uh, Ken Mansfield's piece was interesting because uh, Ken first heard the album and he was sitting in a small studio near the Capitol Tower with George while George was remastering the album because he didn't mm -hmm. like the way Capitol had mastered the album. And then um, Dennis Dyken of the Smithereens wrote a really great piece with the idea of how we were always, you know, anticipating these Beatle albums so much. And uh, his thing was, you know, really captured that anticipation that you would have for a Beatles album and the White Album in particular. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was always fun to do that. And, and Al Sussman wrote a, a great piece about, you know, tie, uh, weaving together what was going on in 1968 and what the Beatles were up to. Mm -hmm. And you had some interesting things happening at the same time. The Beatles are in the studio recording Revolution, where literally there's a revolution in France, uh, you know, going on at the same time. And, you know, in the United States, Wild in the Streets, this film is making its debut. So just a lot of strange coincidences of things happening, you know, at the same time. Mm -hmm. Bruce, was the the um, the media's reaction and the press's reaction, was it very positive overall in the U.S. and in other parts of the world? Because you do cover Canada. Yeah, I know Pierce Hemmings thing you have in the book. I think in the U.S. the mainstream media really didn't uh, go for the White Album that much. And, and I remember the very famous issue of Time magazine with an astronaut and a cosmonaut symbolically racing toward the moon. And I remember getting that issue because my family subscribed to Time. And I flipped to the music section, and there was this really cool picture of Paul behind the piano and John and George and Ringo. And I think John had this parrot or some type of exotic bird with him. And I thought, gee, this will be great. And I'm reading the review. And, uh, you know, they didn't particularly like it that much. Uh, you know, the Beatles' best abilities and worst tendencies. I didn't really like that quote. Mm. I didn't get Newsweek, but Newsweek was even worse. Caveat emptor, buyer beware. And the guy who reviewed it just didn't get it. You know, he um, thought that the Beatles had put their tongue in cheek and got it stuck in the bubble gum. Hmm. Uh, and, you know, and he said he, he thought it could have been a fine single album and maybe even bothered to put a picture on the jacket. And he just didn't get the fact of, you know, having the jacket like that was really cool. So he missed the point, although he did like some of the songs. Oddly enough, he liked George's Long, Long, Long and Savoy Truffle about as much as anything that he liked on the album. You know, in the U.S., you had that, but then Rolling Stone, which was in its infancy, I guess about a year or so old, Rolling Stone praised it in a very insightful review because, you know, this was the first album, not counting Magical Mystery Tour, after Sgt. Pepper. And, uh, you know, basically what they said was, look, that... This was uh, John, Paul, George, and Ringo, four individual people with different styles and abilities, and said that the Beatles were no longer Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band, and in fact might not even be the Beatles anymore. Mm. That's pretty heady stuff. In the UK, it, it got great reviews in the UK. The London uh, the Times of London, uh, the Sunday Times, and the London Observer all gave it great reviews, as did... Uh, Disc and Musico, Echo, Melody Maker. So, you know, much better reviews in the UK than in the US. Hmm. Very interesting. I'm just wondering because um, I'm always reminded of a show that we did here on Things We Said Today when we had Candy Leonard on. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about how a lot of the fans couldn't adjust to the change in the Beatles going from Rubber Soul to Revolver. It was too, too drastic a change. And so... Here they are from there going to Sgt. Pepper, Magical Mystery Tour, and this. For a lot of fans, was this a, a little bit too much change and too much advancement? Or, or did you get a mixture of reactions from the fans from their remembrances at the time? I think they most of the people seem to really like it in the fan recollections. Although, I think one guy, I love what he said, he said that, you know, when he first heard it, Revolution 9 scared him, and it still does. <laughs> I mm -hmm. thought that was a great quote. Uh, 
you know. It's and meant so to. in that regard, <laughs> you know, I personally, not that I listen to Revolution 9 on a regular basis, but I think it's, you know, something that is an important part of that album, and it wouldn't be the wide album without it. Uh, mm-hmm. I maybe, you know, maybe not everyone agrees with me, but I really feel it. it belongs there. So yeah. it wasn't um, a jarring experience for some, maybe it was for some, to go from the psychedelia of uh, Sgt. Pepper and for us here in the U.S. Magical Mystery Tour, and suddenly that was all out the window and gone, and it was black and white and pretty basic guitar, bass, drums again. And Yeah, uh, but we had, uh, we had a little bit of that with Lady Madonna, which was, you know, your basic rock and roll and... Being in New Orleans, of course, to me, that type of piano style, I grew up on with Fats Domino. So, you know, Lady Madonna was a rock and roll thing. And then Hey Jude was this beautiful sing-along anthem and Revolution kicked ass rock and roll. Nothing psychedelic about that. So, you know, there were some signs that the, uh, you know, the Beatles uh, uh, were getting more toward uh, rock and roll again and weren't quite as going to be out there. So I think the signs were there if you picked up on them. Mm-hmm. How about the, um, let's talk about the uh, the contrasts uh, between the packaging of where the Beatles yeah. had been in 1967 with the two albums in the U.S. and with the bare bones, plain, blank, white album. Yeah, I mean, look, to me, I thought it was really cool. And the fact that it was numbered and I, you know, noticed at the record store that my album had a number and, you know, the one or two others that were still at the store because he only had five in had a different number. So I thought that was really cool. I didn't understand the inside joke of, you know, it's a limited edition of three million, but uh, I thought it was cool. And even though the cover was white, the poster was quite a knockout. And, uh, you know, you have the four portraits. So, to me, I found it cool and um, didn't bother me in the least. So you couldn't persuade your mother to let you get all five because they were all different numbers. No, and and Bill at Studio A wouldn't have sold me all five. You know, I was <laughs> I was lucky that Bill put one aside for me. You know, mm. so because uh, you know he only had five and I got one of the five. Mm. There were, I'm sure, other people that were disappointed and had to wait till Monday to get their copy. Mm-hmm. Bruce, can you talk about uh, in your book? how much you dedicate to uh, the formation uh, of Apple Corps and how far you take the Apple story in your book? Yeah, I, you know, basically start with, you know, I open up with the Beatles on The Tonight Show merely because that's where many fans in America first heard about Apple and then kind of go back in time as to how they set it up and point out, you know, this wonderful quote from John Lennon, you know, We've got this thing called Apple, which is going to be records, films, and electronics, which all tie up. And John's saying this on The Tonight Show. And when I give talks on the Beatles, I read that quote. And then I say, so let's update this a little bit. we got this thing called Apple, which is going to be music, video, and computers, which all tie together. And then I take out my iPhone and say it even has an Apple on the back. So... You know, I find that fascinating. And then, of course, I explained that although Apple was set up, at least we were told for utopian purposes, you know, someone wants to make a film on grass, come and see us, we'll put out your movie. It was actually set up for tax reasons. And being a tax attorney, of course, I found that quite interesting. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I just go through the, the beginning of Apple and skim over the later stuff. And I do spend, of course, coverage on the first four. Uh, because, you know, that was really cool, you know, for a record company to come out with those four records and just four brilliant records. Although, of course, no way was a brass band record going to get, you know, airplay on AM radio in the States. And sadly, Jackie Lomax's Sour Milk Sea, written and produced by George with all of the Beatles except for John Lennon, plus two other people who played on the White Album with Eric Clapton and Nicky Hopkins and it just gets lost in the shuffle, although it was a top 30 hit in Canada. Mm -hmm. And those were the days. What's interesting about those were the days was when Hey Jude got to number one in England, which, of course, you know, everyone knew it would. Paul said, we're really excited about that, but what we'd really like is to see Mary Hopkin get to number one. Well, Paul, be careful what you wish for. 
because in the UK, no matter how you slice it or dice it, those were the days by Mary Hopkins was a much bigger hit. It was number one on the charts, significantly longer than Hey Jude, and it outsold Hey Jude. Mm-hmm. Huh. Interesting. Mm. And it was the um, opposite here. Yeah. Here, uh, particularly on Billboard, Hey Jude was number one for nine weeks, whereas in Record World and Cashbox, uh, those were the days overtook it after, say, about five weeks. But in the UK, uh, those were the days was number one for, say, five weeks or six weeks, depending on the chart. Hey, Jude was only number one two or three weeks because Mary Hopkins knocked it off. Mm-hmm. Bruce, could I ask could I ask a question about how Apple juggled their first three albums, which were all released within a month of each other? George's first solo album, John and Yoko's infamous Two Virgins and the White Album. And yeah, in the, in the UK, they all came out around that time. In the US, I think Two Virgins probably came out in January as best I can determine. But there, there wasn't a lot of promotion for it. I know when I went to Studio A in New Orleans, uh, I did get Wonderwall music and enjoyed some of the tracks. I found it interesting, but it wasn't given a lot of promotion. And certainly, um, you know, Capital wasn't going to promote Two Virgins in the States because it didn't come out on Capital. It came out on a smaller label, Tetra something. Gr- Tetra Grammaton. Yeah, I never can pronounce it because I think a tetramycin, which is an antibiotic, <laughs> uh, which might be fitting in this case. But the interesting thing about it was, you know, the company president and Bill Cosby was associated with the label, but he wasn't the president. And yes, the same Bill Cosby. But anyway, he said he would be shocked if it didn't sell several million copies. Of course, that had to be a bunch of puffing because uh, it did not sell a lot of copies. And I remember going to the record store and going with the full intention of buying it. And um, I remember Bill telling me, Bruce, it's not a conventional Beatles album. And he played, you know, a little bit of it for me. And I decided not to buy it and to save my, you know, four or five bucks. And, of course, when I began collecting Beatles, I bought one for $75. (laughs) (laughs) Bruce, I just want to talk about, with Apple Records, when we were at the White Album Symposium, and we talked to Chris Thomas, and, you know, you get all these conflicting reports about what went on in the studio, were they breaking up, and various people like Chris Thomas or Ken Scott would say that they had a blast recording the Beatles. Uh, Chris in particular said the only time there ever was a problem was when they talked about Apple and when they talked about business. Yeah. And when you take a look at Apple Records, the Beatles were very involved with the other artists on Apple. Initially, initially, yeah. Well, certainly George Harrison for a very George long was time. Paul, Paul initially, out of the first four records, Paul was involved with all four of them. You know, he produced, he wrote songs, he played on George's song. And when the business started turning sour, Paul had nothing to do with Apple. And, you know, his singles and albums came out with labels that didn't have an Apple on them. So he turned sour fairly early on. And then when Alan Klein came in, the emphasis was, you know, this is going to be the Beatles and their solo works and nobody else, which was a real shame I remember talking about that with Al Sussman at uh, Beatle Fest or the Fest for Beatle fans. And in the audience was Peter Asher nodding his head in agreement as we talked about how sad it was for those other artists to be kicked to the curb and cut by Apple because of Klein coming in. Yeah. So Klein didn't really care about any of the any of the other artists at all? No, no. He saw the money in the Beatles and that was and- it. Would you say that, at least initially, with Apple Records, was it exciting for the Beatles themselves, or because they tried to carry on simultaneously their own records together, and their solo records with Wonderwall Music, and the other artists, that maybe it was also maybe a burden? I think to Paul and George, it was exciting. You know, here George was, he had a song that the Beatles weren't going to record, he gave it to Jackie Lomax, and got everybody but John to play on it, and also got his buddy Eric Clapton on lead guitar and Nicky Hopkins to play piano. And to him, it was an exciting thing. And then go off to L.A. and do this Lomax album. Uh, you know, to, uh, and in Paul's case, you know, here we are. Gee, I'm going to do this brass band single, and 
Paul had been trying to pedal the song Those Were the Days. He didn't write it, but he loved it. He heard, saw this folk duo play it in, you know, in London and right. uh, just thought this is a great song. And he knew the Beatles were never going to record it. So he was all excited about Mary Hopkin because he knew he could get her to record it because he was, you know, in charge of her and basically got her to record it. And he was vindicated. It was a smash hit throughout the world. So I think initially... Paul and George absolutely loved what they were doing with Apple and didn't view it as a burden. Yeah. But when you think about George, I mean, he worked with Jackie, he worked with Badfinger, he worked with uh, Billy Preston yeah. and Doris Troy. He was really into helping those artists. So yeah. it must have been extremely frustrating for him to see oh, no most of these it. records not sell at all, with, with the exception of Badfinger, who still should have sold 10 times as much as they did. Yeah, you know, I mean, Capitol in the States, Ken Mansfield said he really tried to break the, the, the Ivies with, um, you know, Maybe Tomorrow, the pre-Badfinger single, and, you know, had a bunch of those pressed and nothing happened with it. So Capitol, I don't know what they, whether they shredded them or what, but they pressed a hell of a lot of that single, and, of course, it didn't sell worth a damn. I bought one. All right. <laughs> <laughs> What was the story with the Ivy's album, Maybe Tomorrow, only coming out in two countries? I think they just didn't think there was sufficient demand for it based on the fact that the single had bombed. Hmm. So if a single bombs, why are you going to spend the money on an album? Right. Yeah, that's too bad. Yeah. How much of a part did Apple play, do you think, Bruce, in the Beatles breaking up? Well, I mean, it added pressures, but I think the... You know, I, I think John summed it up best when Brian died. He told Alistair Taylor, we fucking had it. Mm. And I think his thing about it was that John knew the Beatles were great musicians, but they weren't businessmen. And, uh, you know, Brian kind of ran things. They told Brian what to do, and then Brian would make sure it happened. So John realized right away uh, when Brian died that that was it. And I think Brian's death is what really broke up the Beatles. I don't think it's fair to say it was just yoko or just that i think the death of brian was the beginning of the end okay did the beatles have to expand into so many different departments couldn't they just have focused on their own record label well i mean ken when you have a genius like magic alex there you gotta have an electronics <laughs> department <laughs> yeah magic alex who you know for those who I mean, I know that everyone on the show does, but some of the listeners, John found him to be a self-proclaimed electric genius, and his credentials was he was a Greek television repairman. Mm -hmm. But in all fairness to Magic Alex, uh, some of his ideas, of course, were off the wall. He was going to have this hover thing that you'd put over under your house to raise it above the ground. We could have used that in Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans and all such other crazy ideas. But he did have this idea where you could walk in a room and say, telephone, call Susan, and the telephone would do that. So he was on to voice recognition early on in the game. So he had some good ideas. But, you know, yeah, they, they tried to do too much, and they saw right away they had no business being in the retail clothing business and all these other things. Uh, they should have stuck to music, which is, of course, what they always did best. How do you feel about and we've been talking about this ever since the box set has come out, what some people might call revisionism. I you know, love the, uh, I absolutely love the remix. I have somebody who always felt that the music should be remixed, done tastefully, of course, with the idea of being, look, if the Beatles in 1968 could have had so much bass that your needle would have bumped off the turntable on birthday <laughs> and almost every other song on the album, they would have done it. They wanted that bass. For Revolver, they wanted to record it at Stack Studio in Memphis till the Abbey Road engineers finally gave them more of a bass sound. So the fact that it has more bass, yeah, that's something I think the Beatles would have wanted uh, in that regard. And I think the idea is, look, you know, you want this music to be lasting and going down through the ages. And so if you're hearing contemporary music with that bass sound, you know, and then you hear a Beatles record, it might sound to you, well, it's a little flat or what's all the excitement? Kind of like, unfortunately, kids today who watch a black and white movie and they, they're turned off by it because it doesn't have color. So 
in that regard, if you want to appeal to the younger generations, and and I think, Alan, you and I have this discussion at the symposium, it's kind of like you can record classical music on the instruments of the day, or you can record them on more contemporary instruments. Is, you know, is that wrong to do that? You know, I don't think it is. So I think Giles did a great job on it, and, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm all for it. I really felt all along that the catalog did need to be remixed. It gives it greater clarity. One of the interesting things at the symposium, though, that Chris Thomas pointed out was sometimes too much clarity can be a bad thing because what you were trying to do when you mix a record is you're trying to make a good sounding record and not worry about clarity. So I thought that was an interesting point he made. Um, but I personally do like it. And like I always say, you know, if you're not happy with it, the original is still there. As much as I loved the remix for Sgt. Pepper, I miss in a day in the life when John's vocal doesn't pan, you know, all around the room. Yes, yeah. And so every now and then I'll go out and play the original. I asked Giles why he did that. And he said, look, I tried it and it didn't fit in with the rest of the album. OK, I get it. You know, he gave me a valid reason for why he changed it. I can accept it, but I still like listening to A Day in the Life when the voices move around the room. But as far as the White Album, you know, there are one or two things that I would have said, gee, maybe you could make Ringo saying, I've got blisters on my fingers a little louder and a yes. few things like that. But some of the songs on the album that were, you know, kind of overlooked, like, you know, Piggies or Long, 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 I think sound much better than they've ever sound. I think long, 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 the improvement on that is just tremendous. So my take is I really love it. So, um, Bruce, at the end of your book, you have a, you know, song by song recording details and descriptions of, you know, the takes and what was chosen, how the mixing went, all yeah. of that stuff. You've got the dates, you've got the personnel. You mentioned, I think, in the intro, or maybe it was when we were talking, that that you went to Apple on one of your consulting things and sort of cleared with them the whole idea of doing this book and and all of that. Did you get to see documentation or hear anything? No, ex- and I mean, and and it's not a case of Apple clearing and saying, "Oh yeah, we're endorsing the book." It's a case of, "Oh okay, you're doing another book," so. I don't want anyone to be misled and think that this is an official Apple product by right. any means. But they're aware of the books. And uh, over the years, I've sent Apple many images. And, you know, and you'll see them. I got a very nice credit and pepper. Uh, some of the images in the White Album uh, book, are, um, you know, were sent to them by me. And, um, you know, I have a good relationship with Apple. But as far as them opening up the the documents for me know it's kind of a case of you do your thing and uh you know good luck with it we hope it turns out well thank you very much for sending us a copy type thing so uh you know i'm not really getting what i what i do get though is that they are interested in my input and um you know when they're tacking on a project i might make certain suggestions of things and and you know some of them i'm sure are or given serious consideration and even followed. And some of them are probably thought, well, that's not the direction we want to go in. But, you know, I, I think the fact that they'll listen to anything I suggest uh, shows that they are interested in putting something out that the fans will appreciate because, you know, they know I'm more than just somebody writing books on the Beatles. They know that I'm a big fan of the group and its music. Mm-hmm. So in, in that regard... Uh, I think it's been a good relationship. I was able to actually hear the remix and the outtakes in July in London at Abbey Road. And, you know, it was great to kind of hear everything back then. And, and of course, I wondered in the back of my mind, of course, it sounds good in Abbey Road. What's it going to sound like at my house? Well, Mm -hmm. my, my home system is not as good as the one at Abbey Road, as you can imagine. But sounds pretty darn good even in my car. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Darren, you have any last questions? Or? I get into the the physical details, and that's uh, of records, and that's always been why I've loved your books, Bruce, from the Thank very you. first one. Because I, growing up, from the first records I owned, which was from when I was four, and my show and tell phonograph, I guess 
you know, sitting watching the labels spin, and I was always mesmerized by the Apple. Uh, little things like I don't think I was ever aware until the past month or two that the UK White Album package cover was a top loading. Yeah, uh, where the the record slip slid out of the top. Yeah, I'm assuming from day one in the U.S. it was the conventional record. Yeah, it was. Outside. It was in the U.S. It was a die cut white sleeve normal side loading in the uk it was a die cut on one side only black sleeve loading through the top was there any reason other than maybe just to be different that they did it like that in the uk where it was top loading as far as i know no reason why and the black gotta have a slit somewhere i don't think it really matters where you put it the black inner sleeves for the white album yeah, I, I think um, it just looked classy. Like the, the sleeves for the single Hey Jude were black, and I'm right. assuming that's why they did it. Capital didn't feel like spending the extra money on the black inner sleeves. So it was standard white paper sleeves here. Yeah. Right, okay. But I think, okay, apart from Pepper, which had, you know, a, a specially designed inner sleeve with, yeah. you know, apart from that, it was also sort of unusual for us to take out a record and find a white, plain white sleeve because and before pepper until you know through revolver all capital records came with a sleeve that advertised other capital records yeah that's correct but yeah. by this time capital was getting away from those and was going to you know the more generic white sleeves mm -hmm. for that product mm, good point i completely forgot about that alan so okay. in, if we're wrapping up then of course i want your listeners to know that the book is called the Beatles White Album and the Launch of Apple. It is available on my website, beetle.net, and there is a special collector's edition, which is limited to 500 numbered copies. I've got about 150 more still available. It comes with a really groovy poster. It comes in an O case that is individually bait stamped, sequentially numbered, like the White Album was. Uh, let's see. Um, it also has an envelope that has the replicas of the contents of the first four press kit with the essays written about the Beatles and the other artists and of course a bookmark what would a something be without a bookmark and the fun thing about the poster is it has kind of a really colorful poster done in the same style as the White Album poster and when you flip it over since I couldn't put the song lyrics it has excerpts from the book on the back of the poster <laughs> nice nice Okay. Any uh, appearances you want to talk about uh, in the near future for you, Bruce? I know you're going to be at the Fest for Beatle fans. I will be at the Fest for Beatle fans. I may possibly be back at Abbey Road on the river. I took last year off, and I may or may not be back there this year. So check my website to see if I will be or not. Okay. Very good. Would you give so, the website? Give the website address. Yes, it's Beatle.net. So like the musical group, the Beatles, but no S, dot net. In closing, Bruce, how far will the New Orleans Saints go? Uh, this team is good enough to win the Super Bowl. The question, of course, is you need talent, which they have. You need good coaching, what they have. You need to work hard, which they have. And you need a little bit of luck. So if the luck goes their way, they will win the Super Bowl. If they get all some right. bad breaks, they won't. Need all, all of right. that. <laughs> and anyway, it will not be quite as dramatic as that first Super Bowl win and by the way, for that one, I did stay at the Deauville Hotel in room 1218, which was the room Paul and Ringo shared. <laughs> a Beatle fan to the end. There you go. <laughs> All right. Why don't we give the folks our contact information, starting with you, Darren. All right. Well, uh, I'm at WFUV, and you can email me at WFUV. My address is... Uh, believe it or not, Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org, D-A-R-R-E-N-D-E-V-I-V-O. I have a Facebook page called Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio, which is my uh, broadcasting page. And uh, so those at the moment are the two best ways to reach out to me. Uh, so check those out. All right, Alan, how about you and giving the folks our contact information as well. Okay. Well, you can reach me on Facebook at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. 
Uh, you can reach all of us at our email address, Things We Said Today Radio Show, that's all one word, at gmail.com. We're on Twitter at sign Things We Said Fab. And we have a Facebook page, which is Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans. Okay, very good. And for me, Ken Michaels, you can reach me at my email address, which is everylittlething at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. Be sure to check it out every single week for Beatles trivia and games, where you can win one of nine great prizes. Hopefully soon, one of those prizes will be Bruce's new book. It will be, and I'm going to sign off, guys, because the Saints have just kicked off. Okay. (laughs) Always a pleasure, guys. Bye, Bruce. (laughs) Bye-bye. Well, I guess it's it's the Beatles and the Saints for him. <laughs> I don't know which is more important. You think? It sounds like the Saints carry a lot of weight. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm envious as a Jets fan. I would love to have that uh, <laughs> uh, success right now. The Saints are my second favorite team, so you know I'm rooting for them. I'll be rooting as well tonight, okay. as All we right. were. And later on, privately, you and I, Darren, will talk about the Mets' latest move. <laughs> or we'll save that for another show mix that in (laughs) anyway before we go just want to let you guys know that our next show will be the week of january 7th you mean this uh, is our last show of the year yes it is oh so uh we'd like to wish everybody a merry crimble and uh, a very new year and want to thank everybody for their support of the show I uh, want to thank uh, Matt Burley at Fab Four Radio for carrying us. And Steve Marinucci, who, of course, started the show with me many, many years back. And Michael Lynch, who wrote the theme for our show. And still, we're playing it. And anybody else you guys want to thank? I would like to thank uh, the two of you for asking me to join uh, several months back. And I'm looking forward to uh, my first full year as one of the hosts of uh, things we said today. So thanks for uh, thinking of me and including me in the fun. Good and to as have I you. said, yeah, you, you know I've had you in the back of my mind there for the show for all these years. Oh, uh, well, Ken, let's not reveal our secrets to the public. <laughs> Alan, how about you? Oh, just thanks, everyone, for staying tuned. Yeah. I just want to thank everyone for just being fans. I was just going to say, this is turning into a <laughs> It's been a funny year, you know. <laughs> anyway, it's been a great year, too. And uh, by the way, for those of you wondering, yes, we will be talking about the new box sets for Wildlife and Red Rose Speedway. It might be our next show. Don't know for sure. But uh, it is coming up in January. Okay? On behalf of uh, Alan and Darren... And Bruce Spizer, who was a great guest on the show. Uh, Thanks so much for listening. Thanks to all of you for your support of this show. And we will see you. And we will see you. We'll see you same time next year. Mm